Apple's 2023 WWDC presentation was packed with announcements. They usually don't introduce this much hardware at the developers conference, but this time around the new product announcements just kept going and going. There's a new MacBook Air, Mac Studio, Mac Pro, and on top of all that, the long-awaited mixed reality headset. I don't care so much about the MacBook Air, but there's a lot to cover with the other three products. So let's talk about it. I was surprised to see updates for both Mac Studio and Mac Pro. The big winner out of the two is certainly the Mac Studio. The Mac Pro feels like a very rushed product. It feels like Apple felt obligated to deliver on its promise, so they just hacked something together and called it done. First off, there's no new SoC specific to the Mac Pro. On one hand, that's understandable, since the Pro market is very small, so it doesn't make a lot of sense to invest so much money in R&D for such a small segment of the market, but at the same time, from a consumer's perspective, there's no real reason to get the Mac Pro over the Mac Studio. The performance is going to be exactly the same on both products. Sure, there's the ability to add some extra cards through PCI, but the connectivity options are very limited. For example, it doesn't look like we can connect a regular GPU card. And from what I can tell, we also cannot upgrade the SoC when the new M3 or M4 comes out. So if we can't improve on the GPU performance and we can't upgrade the SoC, there's little incentive to get the Mac Pro. At least if you're a 3D artist or a designer, there's no real reason to get it. You won't be able to increase the performance of the machine over the Mac Studio. On the plus side, the SSD is upgradable, but it's also proprietary, so if you want to upgrade your storage, you have to pay a hefty premium. Which brings us to the big elephant in the room, pricing. If we use the exact same specs on a Mac Studio and a Mac Pro, the Mac Pro will be a lot more expensive than the Mac Studio. 7,329 euros for the Mac Studio and 10,829 euros for the Mac Pro. That's three and a half thousand euros more for the exact same specs. Sure, we get some extra ports on the Mac Pro, a shiny case, and the ability to connect some extra hardware, but three and a half thousand euros extra is a lot of money for the limited expandability options we get. For me at least, the Mac Pro is absolutely horrible value for money. You're better off getting a Mac Studio and spending the extra money on a good monitor and whatever other hardware you might want. Now, let's talk about GPU performance because things there look quite incredible. 3D artists using Octane can now render up to three times faster. Apple says that the M2 Ultra is around three times faster than the M1 Ultra when rendering with Octane. That is an insane performance boost. I don't use Octane, but let's pretend that the same speed improvements will apply to Redshift. As we found out from the M2 rendering video, results will vary wildly depending on this scene. So let's revisit these tests and see where the M2 Ultra lands. And let's start with the jungle scene. This one was a huge problem for the M1 Ultra. Even the M2 Max could go toe to toe with it. So if we use Apple stats, the M2 Ultra will finish the scene in one minute and 31 seconds. That manages to beat the 3060 Ti and is getting a lot closer to the 4090. 4090 is still the king, but the gap is getting smaller and smaller. Now let's revisit the office scene. There, things look very exciting. If the extrapolation is correct, the scene will finish in four and a half minutes. That puts the M2 Ultra way ahead of the 3060 Ti and extremely close to the 4090. It doesn't manage to catch up, but it's close. That to me is super impressive. But since things vary wildly depending on the scene, let's say that in this case the M2 Ultra is only two times faster than the M1 Ultra. Then the M2 Ultra will finish the scene in six and a half minutes. So that would put it around two times slower than the 4090. But of course, this is just pure guesswork. We have to get our hands on an M2 Ultra to actually see how it performs. Now, let's check one last Redshift scene, the living room one. Here in theory at least, the M2 Ultra should finish the scene in five and a half minutes. This puts it way ahead of the 3060 Ti, which is extremely encouraging. 
Unfortunately, I don't have the times for the 4090, but my guess is that the M2 Ultra will probably be 60 to 100% slower than the 4090. But let's see, I will try to do some benchmarking there, so if that happens, I'll keep you posted. Overall, it looks like Apple fixed the small caching issue on the M1 Ultra, and as a result, the rendering speed has improved immensely. Another thing worth noting is that my poor iMac Pro is completely destroyed in all of these tests. It's consistently 5 or more times slower than the M2 Ultra. So I think the M2 Ultra is finally going to be the SoC to get if you're upgrading from an older computer. Mac Studio is definitely the best value for money here, at least if you want to stick with a Mac. The Mac Pro, on the other hand, feels like horrible value for money. I wouldn't recommend anyone upgrading to that. Okay, so that's the Mac side. Let's now talk about the new exciting product. Apple's direction is absolutely on point. I think they made the right decision to focus on mixed reality rather than virtual reality. We're definitely going to see more companies going that direction. Virtual reality always felt like a very isolating experience to me, and the good thing with Apple's headset is that you can choose how to use it. If you want total immersion, you can just turn the dial, and now the outside world is completely cut off. But I think the majority of the users will spend most of their time on the mixed reality environment. Apple has absolutely packed this thing with technology. They have higher than 4K resolution per eye, which is amazing. They have a ton of cameras to evaluate space and hand recognition. And they also have neat tricks to communicate with others, either virtually or physically. There are still things though that are a little bit unclear. For example, I'm not sure how Vision Pro could enhance day-to-day -day work. I think as an entertainment device, watching a movie or playing a game, it's going to be fine, but as a work computer, I'm not really sure. I like the idea of working on multiple screens without really cluttering the real-world environment, but would you really put this big clunky headset on your head every single day? I don't really see that happening. You would probably use it in the first few days, and then it will start collecting dust on your desk. For sure, Apple knows that, and I'm certain that they would have liked to have something that was closer to regular glasses. But yeah, the technology is not there yet. I'm sure that version 5 of Vision Pro will be something that people would actually use. For now, it's just a version 1 product for early adopters. These are the ones who will basically fine-tune the product and have it refined for the users of version 4 or 5. It was the same with the Apple Watch. At the beginning, it was a hodgepodge of ideas, and after constant iterations, we're now at the refined product that is Apple Watch. I don't think a lot of people remember the silly ability of the first version where you could uh, send drawings to other watch users. It was silly <laughs> and it had no real use, so they quickly got rid of it. So the same thing will happen here. They will quickly learn from the users of this first version what works and what doesn't, and they will quickly refine it. And once the technology manages to catch up, we will manage to get a glimpse of what Apple actually wanted this first headset version to be. As a computing device, I don't really think it has the processing power needed. For Excel sheets and Word documents, it's absolutely fine, but would we be able to do any 3D work with it? Probably not. If it's a complete M2 processor, that means that the GPU power is limited, so it won't be able to do really complex things graphically. Developers basically have to target an iPad for their apps. I think Vision Pro will be at its full potential once it's connected to a desktop computer like a Mac Studio. But that's where developers have to jump in and provide a ton of good experiences with it. If we could use ZBrush, for example, with Vision Pro, then I could see it being amazing. Imagine being able to see all the details of your sculpt right in front of you and also being able to manipulate and adjust the model. I could see that being a killer feature, but using it to type an email, I don't think so. The other thing I predict will hinder the overall experience is going to be the input methods available. Using gestures to perform tasks will probably get annoying really fast. Imagine having to constantly do this to scroll a document. <laughs> I would probably go crazy within the first few seconds. So I definitely see Vision Pro more as a display extension to a desktop rather than someone's main computer. 
And the good thing is that this will be possible from day one. So I'm optimistic that we will get to see some really cool stuff happening. But definitely the developers have to step in and make sure that their apps offer some good experiences. But yeah, for now, it's too early to tell if Vision Pro will be the next big thing. The one last thing I want to highlight has to do with sound. They say that the speakers are close to your head, so I'm not exactly sure if that's going to be good enough. At least I don't think it's going to be as good as wearing headphones. Which also makes me wonder, how good will the experience be on an airplane, which is a scenario they showcased on their presentation. The ambient sound inside the airplane is crazy loud. So how exactly is the headset going to cut off this loud environment? And even if we assume that the headset will somehow manage to achieve that, does that mean that the audio coming out of the headset will just annoy everyone around us? Definitely something we will have to find out soon. I'm looking forward to testing out the headset and maybe even getting one. If I end up buying it, you will definitely be the first ones to know. I believe the headset has amazing potential, and from a 3D artist's point of view, I feel there's some good business opportunities there. But let's wait until we have the final product in hand. So what do you think? Do you find the headset exciting or not? And what do you think about the new Mac Pro? I'm curious to hear your thoughts, so let me know in the comments below. I can guarantee you I will read every single one of them. Take care, and I'll see you on the next one.